supervisors and school board members. Ten minutes after five o'clock, and some of us do want to go to a graduation after the work session this evening. So let me call this work session, work session of a strategic planning to order. And I would like first, you know, recognize and thank uh, Chairman Blova, Chairman of the County, uh, Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, and also uh, Supervisor McKay, uh, representing Lee District on Board of Supervisors for joining us this evening. I'm expecting a Kathy Hutchins from Hunter Mill District and Pat Harry from Spring Beach to join us soon. Our schedule time for tonight's work session is pretty tight. Uh, we are hoping to wrap up all the discussion. I'm not talking about entire presentation, but at least a discussion with uh, involving uh, supervisors by six o'clock. Uh, that can be done. Uh, so I know that uh, we have a 24 slides for the presentation, and I understand that you are going to go through the first seven slides first, and we'll get to the discussion. And at that point, we'll probably have a discussion for about 45 minutes. And those who need to leave at that point could leave, and then board members could continue on a continued discussion and the presentation with for the rest of the slides. Uh, that Again, I want to thank uh, supervisors for joining us. Uh, the school system, the school board has been uh, working on uh, the strategic planning for several months, especially with you know assistance from the very able consultants, you know Dr. Dr. Jimitro and Gina Semenik uh, with ACRA. With the let me turn the whole thing over to uh, Dr. Jimitro. Thank you, Mr. Moon, um, and welcome to the board of supervisors members and um, Chairman Bulva. Um, as they're going to move that to slide presentation, as um, Il Young has shared, that we're going to share just a little bit of brief background information, just to bring everybody up to speed, so we're at the same place, and then really engage in the conversation between the board of supervisors members and the school board members about needs moving forward. Um, so. We talked a little bit about the agenda of where the process, we're going to talk about where the process is, the conversation, and then after we have that conversation, we will share some preliminary findings with the school board about some of the emerging themes that are coming out of the initial data. Everyone's welcome to stay and listen to that, and if you're able to um, uh, remain, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, but this is still an evolutionary process that will be finalized with the full findings being presented in July. Um, just, just so that everyone's on the same page, um, Fairfax County Public Schools has been using the Strategic Governance Manual for the last seven years, from 2006 through 2013, and you're still continuing to use it. You had your three defined um, academic goals, which were expanded into um, a great amount of detail beyond just the general goals. But if you look at those three goals, um, in the fall of this past school year, you took those goals and the expectations of your community and under Dr. Garza's leadership, talked about the portrait of an FCPS graduate. And you translated those student achievement goals into what a student graduating from your system should look like and be capable of doing. And since that time, we've been using both of those pieces of information along with the information that we have collected to um, define what the strategic plan needs to look like to accomplish those academic goals and to ensure that you are producing students that are capable of doing the things you've defined for your graduates. Um, I created this slide. This is not an FCPS document, but I wanted to have people see the connection between your original three academic achievement goals, which has been part of strategic governance, 
and the portrait of the graduate, because they're not two separate entities. They're not, you did one thing for a while and now you're doing something else. It's been an evolutionary process of saying, what is it that the school system needs to be doing to ensure that children can be as successful as possible? So when you take a quick glance at this slide, and there's a lot of overlap in terms of a academic goal with areas of the portrait of the graduate, but I ident ident identified the places that the academic goal number one um, related to the portrait of the graduate characteristics, goal number two, and goal number three, so that you can see the connection between those two approaches. And you have a copy of this, and it, I'm sure it needs work in terms of the FCPS interpretation of it, but um, I think it's important to know that there is a really tight relationship between those, those two approaches. <clears throat> um, Gina's going to take just a few minutes to talk about where the process is at, and then we're going to start the discussion. <clears throat> so many of you have seen this slide, and it's really a visual representation of the process. Could you use a microphone? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Many of you have seen this slide, and it's a visual representation of the, the process for um, the strategic plan. Um, today, we are going to start by show, sharing some of the emerging themes throughout the research um, phase, which was phase one. Um, and what, what you'll see if you look down on the right as we transition through the summer, working with the school board on the goals and the objectives, eventually then it transitions off to the administration where they'll, they'll become more involved in the building level administrators in terms of really identifying you know, the implementations, the action plans, how will we make this you know, really come to life. Um, so phase one, as I said, was all about conducting research, but just to give you an idea of the level of engagement, um, this process began in March um, with individual uh, board member interviews and the superintendent interviews. Um, subsequent to that, we came out and conducted several focus groups that engaged 851 stakeholders, and we did that across all the clusters and then deep within the clusters so that all stakeholder groups um, were represented. We spoke to um, students, to parents, to the teachers and staff and administrators, to community members, to really get a feel for what people valued, what was important to them, what their uh, perspectives were, what their, their opinions and thoughts were about uh, a variety of um, school-related topics. Um, there's no strategic plan without reviewing the mission, vision, and beliefs, of course, because that sort of sits at the helm. That's part of the process, so we're currently doing that as well, and that will be part of an ongoing discussion in July. Um, we also have reviewed um, a number of archival reports and, and lots of data, because um, this, this system has done a lot of research over the years, and a lot of it's very relevant. So we are currently in the process of integrating that, along with what we collected as primary research, integrating what other firms and what you have done yourself to make sure that it is all utilized. Um, we administered a survey online to stakeholders. Um, it does break down the population there, 1,673 students. 8,290 parents, 7,315 employees, and 11,172 community members. So there's over 28,000 um, stakeholders that completed surveys. Um, we are also in the process of analyzing student achievement data. We're doing that at the school and cluster level to take a look not just at the status, your report card, your state report card. We are looking at that as well, um, but also at growth. So looking at not just a percentage of kids that are, are meeting or, or proficiency levels, but what's the growth look like from one year to another. Um, so phase two is where we're at now. We are um, about to uh, present a f some of the emerging themes. And then in July, the school board is going to have to roll up their sleeves. There's going to be a lot of work. And Hank and I will be back to go through um, all of that evidence. It's going to be a very um, detailed evidence document that really will show the, the analyses throughout and the item level analyses of the survey and such and work through what does it mean. So we're integrating that for you. And I, I, I know that you're going to appreciate that rather than us bringing you a bunch of raw data, um, to give you an idea of the focus groups that we've spent several weeks coding that. It's a very disciplined process, so the way we collect data was very disciplined. We have trained um, qualitative researchers that understand how to properly collect that, um, analyzing it. Their an every focus group transcript was analyzed by two independent raters. A third rater would resolve any discrepancy. So it's a very disciplined approach. And the, I think the biggest message there is it's objective. You know, Hank or I or Ecker Group, we don't have a stake in the outcome of this. So that's important because um, for us to be able to stand back and give you a very objective 
um, view of where your stakeholders really see things um, is valu valuable. And I, I know that you understand that or you wouldn't have engaged with us. Um, I think that's it. In July is where we're going to bring the draft plan and the document, and that's where the real work begins and for the board, and your role is going to be to go through that and to really gain consensus and agreement. We're going to be looking for you to commit to a limited number of strategic goals and focus, um, and, and you know, given the goals that you agree to, what objectives make sense, and then trust your administrators and your experts to figure out how to get it done. So your role is to set the strategy, the vision, identify what those goals are, and then the skilled experts have to get involved to figure out how to get that done. And, and we'll help facilitate that. Okay. Well, one of the things that we'd like to do is we add to this data information before we start sharing some of the emerging themes is to really hear from the Board of Supervisors and from the school board members as to um, really your thoughts about what do you believe are the critical issues that need to be addressed for the Fairfax County Public Schools to be the very best that they can? And secondly, what are the opportunities that you see moving forward for the county and the school division to work together in common efforts? And this is really the discussion piece of this. This isn't, we're, we're really looking for the input from the Board of Supervisors and the thoughts from the school board members as you have this dialogue as to what it will take to maintain the outstanding reputation that Fairfax County Public Schools already has and to continue to enhance that. So uh, I'm going to shift it to Sharon and uh, Jeff. Okay, before I actually let Chairman Baloba uh, have a first chance to say uh, anything about this, let me recognize a young man from Senevere, a Boy Scout working toward the to becoming an Eagle Scout from troop number 30, currently going to Westfield High School, Mr. Cole Soares. Would you like to stand to be recognized? <laughs> Thanks for joining us this evening. Well, with that, Chair Bloba. Thank you, uh, Il Yang. And let, let me just first say that um, I hope you have an, uh, the opportunity to review the joint Board of Supervisors School Board retreat that we had, what was it, about a year and a half or so ago? Um, because we, you know, our, our discussion was on this very topic. Uh, what are the priorities of, you know, the Fairfax County Schools? What are the priorities of the Board of Supervisors? Where are places where we intersect? And what are things that we can, uh, can do together uh, in a stronger way and a better way it was a it was a really I think interesting discussion and it um, you know that that report and all of that can be found and can be reviewed and I hope that you use that and I hope that you incorporate it into your study um, one of the things that we talked about at the at the very beginning uh, we had a we had a presentation by Dana Kaufman Dana Kaufman is uh, is with Northern Virginia Community College. And he gave kind of a riveting presentation about the workforce that we're going to be needing, the fact that you know the, the boomer generation <laughs> is aging, uh, will be leaving the workforce, the fact that we are attracting industry to Fairfax County and that there is a need, especially in the areas of technology and STEM, uh, also uh, m medical research and technology. Uh, so there, you know, there, you know, these are areas that, you know, we are we are targeting. And when he looks ahead, and when we looked ahead, we were concerned that that the workforce needed to fill those jobs w may not be there. You know, so you know the students that we have within our public school system, uh, many of them may not have a culture for higher education, uh, or you know, or you know may you know may have a need for for uh, you know a different educational path or stronger educational uh, preparation. Uh, that so the concern was that you know we we will have jobs if there is the workforce to fill them. Um, some, of the other, some of the other issues that, that we've discussed and that we're concerned about 
our, uh, one of our priorities is early childhood education, and that's something that our board has discussed with the with the school board. Something that we're committed to. I think the schools are committed to that as well. Uh, we have, and yet we've just finished funding and being able to implement all day kindergarten. So uh, also being able to make available to young people and families who need it early childhood education at, a, at an earlier level than kindergarten is something we would like to be able to offer. And this really goes to the early, you know, the, what I talked about earlier, preparing children to, you know, to be good students and to, uh, to learn in our school system. The earlier we can prepare kids, the better. And, uh, and you know, and so, so early childhood education uh, also, inequity or, or disproportionality uh, with students and their, the experience in, for instance, the, um, uh, the justice community where um, kids are falling through the cracks and we're concerned about that. They, you know, that becomes a problem for the county and for the uh, for the juvenile justice system and, in fact, you know, for the human services system when kids are struggling and when kids have issues, uh, behavioral issues, uh, mental health issues, um, that we are addressing those things jointly with the Board of Supervisors and the school board together. This is a holistic need that we need to address those things in order to uh, to meet the needs of our students and then to meet the needs of, of our families. And I think I will stop there and um, see if other members of the board, uh, let's see, Jeff is here. Is anyone else here from the Board of Supervisors? So Jeff, you're it next. <coughs> um, well, first let me thank you all for having us here today and for doing this, undertaking the strategic plan. I think it's, it's very important on multiple levels, but uh, particularly from a parent's standpoint, I think many of our parents don't necessarily look at the whole picture of our schools. They're kind of in their own lane, and they don't really see where we're going as a school system and what our goals are. They know the goals for their individual child, but maybe not for the whole system. And I think this is a, a good way to put down in writing what, what those priorities are. Um, and, and I think you'll find our board and the school board are probably in, in total agreement uh, on the priorities piece. I think the difference is, is in how you, maybe how you decide to implement those things, but I think we probably share uh, most of the same uh, priorities. And, you know, I do think that how the strategic plan gets implemented uh, is a really important piece of this, and I know that that, you know, we're way ahead of having that discussion, but, you know, in, in my experience, good strategic plans are ones that are living documents where you can tie back all the initiatives that you're doing to the goals that are in the strategic plan to make sure that you're tracking and doing the things that your strategic plan say. And sometimes we can get out of, out of that process in our day-to-day -day routine. And so I think checkbacks on that and then also uh, a living, breathing document that can always be amended because one of the things that will continue to make our schools great is our ability to pivot into what the latest technologies or trends or best practices are. And so you know, I think how we implement that and how we monitor it and tie back the initiatives that we're involved in become really important. Um, in, in terms of you know m the priorities that I have, they're almost exactly the same as what you just heard from the chairman. I mean, I do think there are great opportunities for collaboration in the human services area, and I have significant concerns, as I know probably everybody in the room does, uh, with some of the mental health issues that we're seeing in some of our schools, uh, with the enormous poverty that exists in some of our schools, and whether the county and schools are working collaboratively enough on solving some of the challenges that come with those, um, with those demographic issues in particular. Um, there was a article in the paper, one of the local papers today, talking about poverty that I, you know, don't agree with a lot of the things that were said in it, but the premise, I think, is one that we need to address, which is are our schools in poverty getting the kind of resources and the kind of attention that 
our Fairfax County Public Schools deservedly get across the board. And I do think, and I'm not sure if the data will show that or not, because while there may have been 28,000 surveys, you know, it's kind of hard to tell whether that's a representative number demographically and economically um, of what, what today's county is. And so I do have some concerns about that long term, and, and I know it's not a concern that only I have. I think probably everybody in the board does. The question is how you tackle that. Um, so the disproportionality issue, the equity issue, um, I think is a real one, and I think it gets uh, more acute as we see major demographic shifts in the county that we're not used to, you know, that are still new. A lot of our uh, residents aren't used to them. They're seeing them for the first time. Uh, some parts of the county have had these demographic trends for a long time. Other parts, this is a new thing. And how we respond to those, I think, is going to chart the course for how successful the reputation is of the Fairfax County Public Schools long term. On the collaboration issue, um, you know, several people in here have served on joint committees of our board. We've seen some recent collaboration on capital facilities. I think um, maintaining our capital facilities and investing in them uh, is a major issue that, uh, you know, I hope um, we continue to ag address jointly. Uh, we need to be creative about the facilities we have and the growth that we know is coming. Uh, some of our areas just can't sustain the amount of growth that we're seeing without major capital facilities investments, and I think that has to be a shared responsibility. Um, I mentioned human services. Sharon mentioned pre-K. I think presents an enormous opportunity for our boards to work together um, on addressing uh, a, a really important issue in the county. And so, um, you know, I'm really interested in seeing kind of the survey results. I'm also really interested in hearing kind of what the long-term schedule is. This is, you know, it's it's an ambitious agenda. Obviously, there's a lot of data here. Um, the July 14th uh, discussion further with the school board and making a draft plan available, you know, I'm kind of interested in hearing once the draft plan is available, how you see the process working from that point moving forward. What are the other intersections of input uh, from the community and other stakeholders as we go through that? And um, that I'll leave with just that question because that's a question in my mind uh, we are, we are, we fully intend to share any and all the information with you know uh, supervisors and if you have any question along the way just to ask us we'll forward it to our doctor Jumetri to respond properly respond to those yeah, as well and, and I appreciate that chairman I and I know that would be the case what I, what I'm asking let me ask it a different way is when do you see the the process ending I mean at what point in time do you think you have what is the goal for when you might have a strategic plan? I mean, Timeline-wise, right, Dr. Um The intention is um, to have a rather in-depth conversation around the data that comes back, um, which will be shared with the board right around the end of the first week of July, so that they have uh, a week, 10 days to digest it before they have a discussion about the data itself on the 18th and the 19th of July, and to begin work based on that information on what they see are the strategic goals emerging out of that information of what's been collected so far. So hopefully some notion of the priorities will emerge out of that. It's a little hard to tell exactly how long that discussion will take because one of the things that's important is that the board um, commits to what those priorities are. And so it may take more than just that discussion on the 18th and 19th to finalize what those priorities are. But once the strategic goals and directions are established, hopefully this summer into the very early part of the fall, it needs to be translated into action plans. And so, for instance, if one of the major strategies is to look at facility kinds of needs for their future planning. Well, what does that translate into what needs to be done over the next three months, six months, nine months, five years to have that process work smoothly? So um, I would imagine sometime very late summer to early fall, there'll be a draft plan that can be circulated to gather additional feedback and information from community members, staff members, um, as the board processes that. But ultimately, it's going to come down to some choices around priorities. Because one of the things that I think all public institutions struggle with, you as a board of supervisors for county services, the school board, is 
there are more needs and demands to be met than the resources that are totally available. We so, know that. <laughs> We've heard that. <laughs> and it's, it's the notion of public service. It's the notion of, of how you make those choices. And in the last five years, for most organizations that provide those kinds of services, those things have become all the more difficult, um, not easier. So working through that kind of conversation and really determine what are the priorities for this particular county moving forward from a school system perspective, from an overall quality of life perspective, will help that process gain some momentum and some, some traction as to the ability to say no sometimes when you have to say no. I think you were going to say something. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a perfect world, this is how it would work. <laughs> or the facilities part, anyway. And um, a, a previous effort between the Board of Supervisors and the school board was a smart savings task force. Um, and it, and uh, uh, Dan Stork and I chaired that effort. It, was, it also was three and three, three board members, three members of the uh, school board and three members of the board of supervisors and you know and the idea was to find opportunities for where we could do things together or collaborate uh, rather than doing things separately and in a perfect world if we could somehow blend our CIP so that if the county knew that it needed a library for instance in the Bailey's Crossroads area, and the schools knew that they needed a school and classroom space, that we could save money and be more efficient by building something that could be used for both things. Um, that would be a perfect world if, if we could somehow blend our CIP and our thinking together as to our facilities and how we pay for them and how we use those things. There was something else that, that I also wanted to, to say. Earlier this week, I had a, uh, I had a program, and Ilyang Moon was present, participated, and so was Ryan McElvain. And it was about uh, the, the work, workforce, the workforce of the future. And we took a look back at the evolution of the workforce we were a farming community in Fairfax County, uh, what we are now and then into the future. One of our speakers, his name was Egan Ryder, and he is uh, with, with Northern Virginia Community College. And he, he, something he said struck a chord, and he was talking about, you know, if, if he could wave a magic wand and change the educational curricula, that, that we should try to couch things more in when when we're working with students about where what kind of career or what kind of path something could lead you to so that when you're taking a course in math or taking a course in you know whatever that that you start to get a student's i guess mind around why is this relevant and where could this lead me um, it, it was it was kind of an interesting comment. It was just you know sort of an aside, but but it really struck a chord with me, and I thought that that was kind of important when when you're trying to prepare young people, um, especially in the case of young people who may not have you know again a a uh, higher education culture into thinking in terms of why should this be important to me, you know why you know why should I. You know why is math that important? Where what are career paths that this could lead to? Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. I thought it was it was really important to hear that. Okay, well, by the way, before we call on Mrs. Smith, I think I had Ms. Hines and Mrs. McLachlan, and then I'll call I'll go to Mrs. Smith. Okay, thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, this is this is exciting. I think you know we're we're planning strategically, and we know that we want to work with you guys on that. So, um, trying to answer quickly the questions that we've been asked. Um, I I think the things um, that. Uh, 
our critical issues are our achievement gaps, and you touched on that, you know, and that gets to the early ed questions um, and all, uh, disproportionality in general across the system. Um, also, uh, uh, Im improving, I think one of our goals in the portrait of a graduate is to improve our measures, you know, how what we're testing kids and the, the data that we send out to the community, which includes you all, um, has been, um, based on state tests, which uh, you know more and more people don't have a lot of faith in. So right. that's one of the points of doing the portrait of a graduate is to say, okay, these are the goals we have for our kids, so we're gonna be measuring those things because we value them. Um, and it gets to that question of what the career world expects and what the college world expects. Um, and then I think another you know, goal for us is to make sure that we're attracting and maintaining and empowering the best educators in the region. So that's something else I th that I think is critical for us. Um, I love the idea of the blended CIP because one of my first things for the second um, question there was co-locating more. I think there's just so many natural opportunities. And um, I know that's the perfect world, but I think we should go ahead and shoot for it, right? Um, um, and then um, also, um, uh, building support in the community for the schools, I think that's a partnership kind of an opportunity for us, you know, and we've been uh, trying very hard the last couple of years to get out there and make sure that everyone who uh, supports the schools um, is doing that out loud, you know, um, and really knows what's going on. Um, and that you guys have started the conversation on the meals tax I think is great because I think part of building support in the community is showing that we're willing to at least try to diversify um, the funding stream and, you know, we're not always going after the same people all the time. Um, and then I wanted to just get back a little bit to diversity, and this is the last point I would make is um, diversifying our communities. And that connection article, I looked at it too, and the title was um, that uh, poverty is scattered across the county, and the truth is it's not scattered. It's concentrated, right? And that is something that the school system kind of uh, inherits in a way because we don't create school-sized pockets of poverty and school-sized pockets of wealth, we inherit them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I mean, I would like to see us, I think this is an opportunity for a pretty high level collaboration when we think about how the county is developed. You know, you look at Reston, and I'm from Reston, so I'm gonna sing its praises for a minute. It is a community that purposely planned for socioeconomic diversity. Um, and that is really good for the schools. Having high concentrations of poverty, you know, up to up towards of 90% in some schools is really not good for the schools. And almost, no matter, research tells us, no matter how much, how many resources we put into that, we're not gonna do as well for those kids as we would if we could spread spread that out a little bit, you know, and have a better mix in all of our schools. So I don't know exactly how to approach that, but it sounds like a planning thing mm -hmm. and a housing planning kind of a thing where we would definitely need to work with the county on that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you again for coming. Okay, I have uh, Mrs. McLaughlin to be followed by Mrs. Smith, and Mrs. Strauss, and Mrs. Schurch, and Mr. Narco Facts. Mrs. McLaughlin. So uh, I we have, a, we have a supervisor, Harry, joining us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. In listening to my colleague, Ms. Hines, I think uh, it very much echoes what both Chairman Bulova and um, Supervisor McKay have already stated. When you look at actually where we are on our goals, um, I, th I think we're all actually identifying the very key areas um, that as a county, we must address together. We can't do them separately. And when I think about the fact that we brought together the two boards through the skipped um, task force, you know, that successful children and youth, trying to look at that disproportionality, trying to also look at um, the issues like early education, um, but also looking at then how are children successful as they come through the system, and then the human services component. Uh, but one thing that I would like for all of us to be thinking about is when we look at the model of um, the Synthetic Turf Task Force and how when we came out of that shared task force together, there was actual concrete plan. It was, here's how we're going to financially commit together. And, and the group brought the recommendation to all of you and to our board, and thankfully we were in agreement. And for the public, what that said was, okay, you can speak to, in, philosophically you share the goal, but then what are those steps? And so I think in my mind, when I've listened to the public watch us from the outside, uh, early childhood education is very much a priority. Um, Chairman Bulova mentioned um, 
you know, full day kindergarten. That was another example of where we kept talking about it that we all believed in it, but what did we finally do? We committed money to it. And my understanding was with early child education, um, it's been described that there's a five-year plan, but I think what the public's sort of looking at us next and what I'm hoping the SKIP program or the SKIP group will come forward and say is, here's some specific action steps. So it's not just that we all agree it's an issue or that we're all committed to it, but where do we really, as the two boards, come down and say, okay, here's, here's where we're going to actually um, put our money. And I think that's where the public ends up saying, oh, you really did take action. And while I'm really proud of the work we did on the Synthetic Turf um, Task Force, we did take a little bit of a hit from the community saying, wow, so you delivered you know, athletic fields, but what about all the other things? So I think we're at a really good juncture to say, you know, look, this was one of the easy ones that we could to address, and it really did help our communities as a whole, not just our schools, but um, our youth and adults. And we know physical education and athletic and recreation activity is so important to the whole person. Um, but those are the things that were sort of weighing on my mind. I, I'm not going to repeat what the three of you already said. I think we're in full agreement. Those are probably the big key flags that we can identify and say we've got to do collaborative work together. I will hope that my colleague, Ms. Evans, might speak a little bit to um, bringing up the Bailey's issue because that was one of the things that we were struggling with from our side on the board is trying to understand this opportunity to have those co-location of services. It is a national model to do that and I think we lost that opportunity. So maybe again, when we look at the shared boards, that's a key area when we look at best practices and that moving toward this urban suburban model that we're sort of um, molding into. We got to do the one last thing. I'll just want I want to emphasize because it came out of our retreat 18 months ago. Um, the Northern Virginia Community College Board gets very concerned about the remediation numbers um, that they see, and I just I pulled up the information that was most recent that we got from our budget staff. I guess it was in the FY 2014 response. But what's important to note is about 26% of our graduates go on to NOVA that we track. And of that percent, um, it's anywhere from 20 to 40% may need remediation. So what that means is really we're talking about 5 to 10% of Fairfax County graduates might need remediation. And I think that's a key piece because what keeps being presented is, do you realize 50% of your students enrolling in NOVA are needing remediation? And I think the numbers are one piece that have to be sorted out a little more clearly, but I, I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that our graduates on the whole are extremely successful. Could I, could okay. I just make a comment on, on that last um, point? It would be interesting to drill down even further and see of that percentage when those students entered our school system, did, were they recent? Did they recently come to us, maybe from some other country, uh, and, and then wind up graduating and needing, continuing to need help once they got into, into community I fully policy. agree, because we want to make sure we're addressing the right problem, and right. you can't have the best solution if you don't know the exact problem. So this I completely agree. Absolutely. You know, many, many of those students are recent arrivals to this country. So right. we, we, we need to get that. So uh, to let, let, let me do this. I, I have a Mr. Smith, Mr. Strauss, and Mr. Schultz, and Ms. Dana Koufax. I want to wrap up all the discussion by 10 minutes after 6 o'clock, which means we have about 22 minutes left, since we don't always get to see a Supervisor Harry and hear from him at our meeting. Supervisor Harry, you can jump in anytime you are ready to, and I'm going to call on okay. Supervisor Harry. Real quick on that, uh, on that point, it'd be interesting also to see the percentages at the other schools, because you know the problem of the NOVA problems mentioned a lot, but... So, Harry, would you like to use oh. the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we are being taped. Is it on or not on? It's on. Okay. Um, what I was saying is I, it, the NOVA problem is brought up a lot of times, but it'd be interesting in addition to, uh, to what you were saying is, is also reach out and get it from the other schools uh, in their remediation numbers, because I know there are issues at some of the other schools, not just with Fairfax County graduates, but graduates from out throughout. Other, other schools, okay. 
just okay. just, uh, one, just yeah. one comment on that. First, I, I think Sharon's exactly right. You know, knowing when they came to our system yeah. helps identify the challenge. But the other piece ties back to what we talked about earlier about kind of career paths yeah. for kids. Because how many of those kids ended up at Nova because there wasn't really another obvious alternative and they thought the only way they would be successful was to go get a college education, whereas if they were on some other technical path, that fed them into a industry, into an occupation that you know they were prepared for. They might not have run into that issue either. And so I think you know drilling down on what's going on there becomes really important. A lot of people look at that as a failure of the school system. There's a lot of other issues involved that we need to identify. We can't just assume that all of those kids meant to end up at NOVA. What else could they have done, I think, becomes a really important question about the product and the portrait of the graduate. Okay. Dr. Lange. Um, y yes. I, very important points. Real quickly on remediation or developmental courses, that's real complex. So we could spend a lot of time just talking about that, but I won't go there today uh, because every college university has their own standard, can set their own standard, use a different assessment, so it's really difficult to tease out really what, what that's about. And, and uh, we visit a lot with NOVA and we have some plans. But on the career and technology education and the career pathways, this board in the legis their legislative program last year, and I think as we move forward to developing next year's legislative uh, plan and program, um, a lot of the challenges we have around career and technology education are really outside of our control as it relates to graduation standards. And we've talked a lot about we have a one size fits all uh, in the Commonwealth. And so I think there's a real opportunity because we, you know, we've talked about coordinating on legislative programming. So if you all, um, you know, we feel like we could de develop some models that are still still very rigorous, that are tied to workforce uh, needs, and we've begun contemplating that. But we would appreciate your support um, because right, there are so many requirements that a lot of these great courses are just squeezed out of the system. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, to be followed by Mrs. Rose. Thank you. Um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you go do something earlier in the day and it fits in with what you're doing now. I was at Franklin Middle School at 8 o'clock this morning meeting with the counseling department. And we do have such a focus now, and some of this came from the state and some of what we're doing, on getting kids to understand the connections between the courses they take and career pathways. And that's one of the things they were sharing at Franklin, how we have a program called Naviance and the kids can go in and look at the courses in the high school. And they're trying to talk to them about career your paths and what you do. So it's definitely a focus of the system and, and it helps. Um, we want to get away from just SOL tests. We want to get to project-based learning, engaging kids in real life problems. And I think we have to see where there are synergies. You know, what, what can we use with businesses more and, and in the county to get kids involved in real life problems when we do this? So I think that could be another area where we could have some synergies to do that work. I have to jump on with what Pat was saying about the zoning issues and, and, and how the housing is. And I don't know what can be done, but it does create difficulties. Um, and I, it, you know, it's hard for our employees to live here. I, I look at my own son trying to find a house, and, and I don't know how we deal with those issues because that affects our community and who's living here and, and the schools in that. So I don't know where there's connections in that. Um, Piece. So I think it's good we're having conversations together because we want to ensure that we keep a vibrant school system that um, has high expectations for students in our changing face of what we're providing in the county. And I think it will be important for us to work together to do that. Thank you. Mrs. Rose. First of all, thank you all very much for coming and joining us today. Um, we were, when we began this process, one of the first, one of our first objectives was to see if we could get members of the board of supervisors to come and, and chat with us about this because we are, we we all serve the same constituency, so we are joined at the hip, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, and speaking of that, one of the one of the unusual strengths of this county is the fact that our school system is so large that. We are serving, Mr. McKay, your children, and Ms. Bulova, we're serving your grandchildren, and we have to serve them extremely well, and, and Mr. Harity, your family. We have to serve those children very well, as well as the, the children who have just arrived from another country, children in poverty. 
And the advantage of such a large school system is that um, I think we can focus, I think, across that entire spectrum. Many school systems that are very small, if you're on one side of the track, you are going to cater to one group of children because the other children aren't there. And on the other side of the track, they are struggling because there are no resources, there's no money, there's no nothing. And so I think we have tremendous strength in the county. When we talk about preparing our children for the future, for college and, and workforce, et cetera, um, for us in the school system, obviously we're held accountable for every child every day. The kids who are here right now, and we worry about their future. One of the things that I don't hear us talk about, and I guess this is a, a, a challenge, um, Hank, for you guys, we worry about preparing the workforce. We know that the companies that have come, they're concerned about the quality of education the children of their current employees will receive, and hopefully excellent education. Then we worry about our children who struggle, and we have a minority student achievement gap, poverty, et cetera, demographics that are very, very concerning to us. And the, the, so it's the, how many of our children, as we are trying to help all of these kids do extremely well, it'd be interesting to know how many of the children are actually in our schools today are actually going to be a part of the workforce. How many are going to go off to work in the um, hedge funds in New York, and we're going to lose them? Will we be able to bring them back? But since we work so hard, obviously, to serve all those children, which we must do, it would be very interesting as we plan and go forward. I don't know that anybody does much study of um, movement and bringing enticing uh, sort of all of our kids back in. And there have been several studies. There was a New York Times study, a Brookings and a Council on Foreign Relations that looked at um, mobility, non-mobility. And again, we're investing heavily in our children and our workforce. And we would like 10, 15, 20 years from now to benefit across the spectrum as we've prepared these kids for all the various jobs or careers. But I don't know, Hank, if you guys do much work on that, but that's been sort of the latest interesting study. Okay, thank you, Thanks. Mrs. Strauss. I have a Mr. Schurz to be followed by Mr. Anakofex, Mr. Sri, Ms. Evans, and Mr. Velkov. Mr. Schurz. I'm gonna to try to be discreet to the questions that are up on, on the board so that um, I kind of try to answer your questions, um, Hank. Uh, looking at what the strategic issues are that have, I think, developed over time and have, I think, come to a great degree of clarity over multiple budget um, discussions with our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors and which continue to be at the center of um, each budget cycle and, you know, anecdotal conversations um, within the community or between the two boards. Um, one is what the long-term, long-range demographics and population centers um, look like and how we can strategically improve um, the county's identification of where um, population is coming from and how they're going to be housed, schooled, transported, et cetera. Because if we don't have that right, everything else is wrong. Um, if we don't have the long-term understanding of what the facility needs are, it doesn't matter if we have the amount of teachers wrong or what their ESL population is or how many buses we're gonna need. Because if we don't have that number right to begin with, all the, we're always gonna be behind, which is basically where we are now. We are in a, in a nexus of um, the infrastructure crush of not having gotten the numbers right in the past. And so whatever it is that has to happen um, collaboratively between the two boards to um, be more strategic about that and, and that's strategic in the, I see in the mid and long range, you know, um, out years. Um, because that planning has to begin now. Um, not only do we have to address, you know, the pressing needs now, but we have to address the out years. So that's, um, that's the first, but the subgroup to that um, is also a shared approach, if you will, 
to to that needier population that we've been talking about that's a lot of subtext um, and how we bring not just students who are, um, and I forget the number of languages and the number of countries because, uh, yeah, that, 196 countries and, and the, all the languages that go with, that if we don't have a strategic plan as a county to um, have language skill acquisition in the English language for not only the students, um, but the parents as well, that continues to burden all of the wraparound services provided either through the school system or if it's not through the school system, it's through the county. And so there isn't a strategic approach I see um, for the delivery of English uh, language acquisition and, 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 uh, and rapid acquisition. And so that's, that's crucial because what that does is every time we, we get the numbers wrong to begin with, the ripple in the pond effect is, is really you know, avalanche in nature because the, mo the more needy students that show up, the more we haven't uh, acquired the facilities, the more we haven't planned for um, uh, the English language uh, acquisition, the more services we need to provide both on the county side and the school side. So, you know, we, it, and the projection is that it's not getting better. So that, that to me is an urgent and compelling thing that both county and the school system need to work together on. Um, and then the other is um, the notion of, of neighborhood schools with those wraparound services and bringing those services, you know, locally into into schools to the greatest um, ability possible. And as Chairman Bulva, you know, s sort of mentioned, is that that strategic planning of where we're putting facilities, where we have people, and meeting the needs of the people there instead of trying to figure out, because I see both the county and the school system uh, perpetually in the how do we find the people, how do we get to them, well, the kids are all coming to school. And so the, the wise use of the resources that we already have um, is you know, incumbent upon us um, and not allowing that to languish. And then the last thing is really a little bit more back on, on our colleague's side is, um, and, it's a, and it's a difficult subject, but it's, a, it's one of those courageous conversations that needs to be had, which is um, housing, you know, do, do, we, you know, do we want you guys to be the second largest landlord in Fairfax County? And what does that mean? What are the long-term implications of that? Um, and uh, housing enforcement, um, tax policies, and what those implications are not only on the county side of the budget and the county's delivery of services, but what that does in a lean linear fashion eventually to to the school system and you know whether it's students arriving you know um, from out of country and then needing remedial services through Nova and ultimately ultimately being subsidized through some kind of services there or whether the services are met in the in the pre-k through 12 and if we don't address the first one we can never get to the pre-k because if we don't get those facilities right we're never addressing the pre-k so that's kind of I tried to be strategic in the delivery yeah, again supervisors are welcome to jo you know jump in at any time I will again I'm gonna wrap up the discussion by 10 minutes after 6 o'clock. I have a Mr. Leonard Colfax to be followed by Mrs. Reed and Ms. Evans and Mr. Becker, which means I'm going to have to limit each board member to two minutes. Mr. Leonard Colfax. I will yield my time to a supervisor if he would like. No? Because yeah, you said you wanted to chime in a little. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I think time, the, the issue of the housing piece is, is very complicated, but um, understand that it's, a, it's an issue that extends beyond you know, our capacity here. I mean, there's a lot of free market issues, but there's also a business community who is squarely behind creating more affordable housing in the county. And I think the issue is not who's the landlord. I think the issue that you pointed out that's very real is where do we put this housing? Um, and I've been saying that for a long time. The concentrations of affordable housing in the county are causing significant problems. And the need for affordable housing in some parts of the county is so high and there is none. So, you know, I think we need a whole lot more affordable housing in the county to serve the workforce that, that, that we have in this county and cut down some of the 
challenges with development in the outer suburbs that create some of the sprawl and traffic problems that we have that our buses are sitting in every day and our parents are sitting in every day. But we got to be strategic about where we put it. And I think that has a profound effect on our kids' ability to learn. If you're a low-income child, that doesn't mean you can't add a lot to a classroom, especially you can add a lot to a classroom where not everyone else is low-income. And so we need to wrap our hands around the services, target them towards the populations where they are, but I think our long-term housing issues are in more affordable housing in strategic places in the county so that every kid has a chance to learn and we can't ignore the fact that we have a affordable housing problem, henceforth the problem with overcrowding, with the explosion of trailers at some of our lowest income schools. That's because low income people want to live in Fairfax County and they don't have a lot of opportunities other places. They're doubling up, they're creating trailer problems at some of these schools. And so I'm happy to have a very courageous you know, discussion about that anytime it is an issue, but I think it's the dispersion of opportunities of housing for people that is, the, is, is at the center of it. Thank you, Supervisor. I have one. Me, right? I oh, your time has been yielded. I'm not yielding it. I was, I was just graciously offering him to comment because he looked at me. And, oh, okay, uh, I go to Mrs. Reed and I come back to you. I go to Mrs. Reed next and then I come back okay. to you, Mr. Nargo first. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Moon. I'll be very quick. Uh, just adding to the discussion, um, and I think it's really been said, but in my view, we have to address the changing demographics and, and trends and look at the numbers and needs and come up with joint strategies to address those particular things. Um, and, and along with that, try to identify what's our role versus yours, where does our work stop and the counties begin. Um, I think, or whether others, nonprofits, because right now it seems like it's such a mixed bag. Nonprofits do pre K, you do it, we do it, a lot of you know, people do it. So, is that the best strategy, for example, for um, uh, rolling out um, early ed when we have a thousand people at the end of the day who are on a waiting list? So, um, so that to me is an issue for uh, what do we do and not do, and what's the new definition of public services? In other words, I, and I think we all agree we don't have enough money to do everything we want to do. So I think we need to have a discussion about what is, what is the new definition of service in Fairfax County. And I do think that needs to be a joint discussion. Um, Multi-year planning is something I think will, will help us as we go forward uh, so that we uh, have discussions that really are much more strategic in nature. And I wonder too, another thought I had about opportunities for collaboration, whether we might focus on certain areas that have unique problems. We all know that the one size doesn't fit all, but the Route 1 corridor, Bailey's, Tyson's are all areas that have very unique and uh, you know, pretty emerging but um, imminent challenges that um, I think really would require a bunch of us to work together. Right now, I think it's very fragmented. And so that would be my other suggestion that perhaps we identify some areas to work on. Sure. On, on that point, that's the, the very areas that you were just describing are also our revitalization areas, places that we've targeted to where we want to see revitalization, redevelopment happen. And so where there are challenges, you know, there are opportunities. And so, you know, looking for ways to redevelop in a way uh, that, you know, helps to resolve some of our capital needs and, uh, and our programming needs as well. So I just, you know, that, that's the way we should be thinking, and I agree with you. So just, just one comment on that. I think it was mentioned earlier, our size being our advantage. This is probably an example where our size is our disadvantage. <laughs> and our one size fits all is hard to, to work around. And, and we find this problem on the county side too, that we're so big sometimes it's hard to be spry and break out of the mold and say we're gonna set different guidelines, different opportunities in certain areas of the county. It's tough, it's tough to do that. You don't wanna create multiple school systems, but you've gotta be spry and not let your size get in the way a lot of times of doing creative things that are targeted into certain areas. Although just as we're looking at revitalization areas and we're looking at smaller bites of uh, the need to revitalize as, and the needs to uh, redevelop in Fairfax County. So we're essentially looking at smaller bite areas. That could be a way of making Fairfax County a smaller place 
to deal with some of those issues and, and not trying to do cookie cutter all over the county, which may not fit, but being able to address things in some areas where we have both challenges and opportunities uh, that we can work together to you know, to resolve or to address. If I could just follow up very quickly, um, the issue of the expanding immigrant population, maybe that's an area, uh, we've alluded to it, I think, but looking at best practices, I know I've talked to Dr. Garza at one of our national conferences, they actually had an immigration center um, that was provided where that's where people started and they had, you know, certain services and indoctrination so that the schools weren't teaching and then the county services weren't doing. And so to me, that might be an opportunity because the trends are only going up. And as we've said all along, our population not only is increasing, but it's needier. So to me, that says we can't do business the way we used to. And so I, I love your word, opportunity. I think, Chairman Bolivar, that's a great way to look at it. But to me, that, as Elizabeth Schultz said, I think that's one of, at the core of our challenges, is because our, our system is changing in terms of who's coming in our doors. And the fact that we can't do anything other than educate who comes in our doors. But at this point in time, I, I know that I have two more board members on my list, but since it is very close to being 10 minutes after 6 o'clock, uh, there is at least one board member, one supervisor who needs to go to graduation, uh, and, and I should let them go. But before they go, uh, I want to take a chairman's prerogative to recognize uh, Chairman Bova uh, to make a statement on some of the things I think you and I talked about a little earlier this evening, and also you had a conversation with the superintendent. One of the major topics of our discussion, this board's discussion on Monday, is uniform school calendar, master schedule, and you had some conversation, you had some thoughts on that. If you could share with us. As we're, as we're talking about uh, joint priorities and I think it's it's on. It's just not in my face, <laughs> which it needs to be. <laughs> um, I I, th I think first of all that we you know even though at budget time that's a tense time uh, for us all. And uh, it, but but I think that the board of supervisors and the school board has a good working relationship and has a track record of working together uh, and you can see some successes the the um, earlier uh, Megan mentioned the uh, the synthetic fields and uh, looking at you know some of the joint things we've done together and some of the uh, you know the capital uh, infrastructure committee that we created and and that resulted in some more flexibility. Um, I, I had a conversation last night with uh, Karen, uh, Dr. Garza. Uh, we attended uh, the uh, Luther Jackson Middle School uh, joint um, concert with the Fairfax Symphony. It was it was fantastic, and the kids were amazing. But we also had a side conversation uh, about one of the things that uh, that the schools would like to do that the Board of Supervisors I think would be supportive of, and that is all day. Uh, all day uh, kindergarten, rather Monday. All, day, all, all day Monday, um, and you know I would be interested in working with the with the school board and with Dr. Garza, uh, you know, to to see how we can make that happen. I know that that's something that the school board is uh, is discussing right now. Uh, it it leads right into early childhood education and, and the school calendar and giving kids uh, the opportunity to have more time to be able to uh, to master their subjects and and uh, and be in the school system and for teachers to be able to have the planning time and the teaching time that they need. So anyway, I wanted to just mention that we had had that discussion. Uh, that's something that I would like for us to work together to see how we could make that happen and how we can make that a priority uh, in funding. And you know, maybe as we're getting closer to carryover, you know, if there's an opportunity at that time, especially if we know that there is a savings in the long term to be achieved uh, by going to a full day Monday, let's let's talk and let's let's put that on our radar screen. Mr. Chairman. Uh, so McKay. I am in violent agreement with Chairman Bulova that we need to solve this this problem uh, together and soon. Uh, the two number, the two top two things I hear in the schools across the, my district are one, teachers need more planning time. This accomplishes that, and two, 
kids need more instructional time, especially in Title I schools who at one point in time had it. And after we went through the all-day kindergarten issue, understanding equitably you need to do this across the county, but our kids in Title I schools, Project Opportunity schools, they, they desperately need more instructional time. And so I think it solves way more problems than it creates. It's long overdue. I'm ecstatic to hear about it. And you will have my unwavering support to find a path to do it sooner rather than later. Thank you so much. W resources. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when it comes to resources, I mean, this, uh, not many times does someone come to you and say, we need additional resources for the two things you hear most about that are a challenge in our schools. I can't think of a better use of resources than to do this. And then we're going to have, uh, school board is going to have this discussion for the second time on Monday. That's the most important topic for the Monday discussion. As soon as that discussion is wrapped up, we will be reporting to the county board of supervisors with the request and all that information you need. And thank you so much for that. You know, Supervisor McKay and, and Mr. Stroke, to uh, thank you for joining us. You are off to the Key Center graduation. And we'll have a five more minutes of a discussion after you leave. So I have, um, thank you. I have Miss, <laughs> Miss Evans and Mr. Welcome, Miss Evans. <laughs> Well, thank you, and um, I do want to also welcome you to, you know, thank you for coming today, and um, I, I appreciate that comment um, on Chairman Bulova um, in support of the, the, um, the Monday uh, issue as well as the teacher planning time issue. You know, when I look at, at other issues that I think are critical for us, I think equity across the county is of primary concern as well, both in terms of programs that we offer and in terms of services. And I think you know, others have touched on that, but I think that's something that we need to deal with. As we look with revi to revitalization, we need to make sure that we think about the schools that, um, particularly when it comes into overcrowded areas, what we're going to be doing and coordinate on that. Facilities, of course, we did make headway on the IFC. We're going to continue on that, and that's also a critical issue. And lastly, you mentioned, uh, last but not least, you mentioned mental health. I think we need to work on health issues, and this is going to be the year that we're going to finally create healthier schedules for our high school students. I appreciate your support and the support of uh, supervisors on that as well. And uh, so uh, that's also an area where we can work together um, to make sure that that works for everybody. Uh, Mr. Verkov and Mr. Rakofet. Uh, so I'm going to answer the two questions really briefly and then follow with um, uh, explanation. So in terms of the critical issue, I think the phrase I would use is one I heard at the VSBA law conference last Friday, which is the resegregation of America, which is another way of saying some of the things that we've already been talking about. And in terms of uh, the cooperation, I would say it, um, it's our responsibility and our, as elected officials to steer a path that preserves and improves the quality of life in Fairfax County for everyone. Um, when I was a teenager in the 60s, growing up in Ohio and visited California, California was heaven on earth. But when it, when I was an adult in the 90s and deciding where to raise my children, I did raise them in heaven on earth. It's Fairfax County. Uh, but my concern is, where is Fairfax County going to be in 20, 30 years? And my fear is that we're going to follow the path of California, which, in my view, you know, degraded. And, and so, I feel like we're at a tipping point, and there's a dystopian vision of the future where it's every man for himself. Uh, those who have the means have their kids in charter schools and, and private schools and get the education that they uh, are able to achieve for their children, and the public schools end up with everybody else. And then there's the utopian vision, on the other hand, where we all pull together, we recognize we're all in it together, um, we commit as a community to provide services for families and children that counteract poverty and, in fact, address the alleviation of poverty. So I, what I'll sum up and say is we're the, we're the decision makers, 
And I think it's our responsibility to make choices that steer us in one direction or the other. And of course, I would prefer steering towards the utopian. Mr. Koufax, you're the last one. And then I will ask if you supervise your final remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you both for coming, and Mr. McKay, who's just left. Um, I think when Hank asked the questions, what's the best way to work together, and, and, and where can we find our synergies, I think what we're doing tonight is one of those very good opportunities. This is the first opportunity that we've, I, I believe we've had. We, we've had board-to-board -board meetings mostly surrounding budget or, or maybe one or two topical issues with presentations without a lot of dialogue. So I think when we go forward, um, I love the idea of the joint task force, but the board-to-board, -board, and, and those are important, but the board-to-board -board dialogue dialogue um, on these issues is very, very important, particularly when we look at our priorities. And so when you talk about where could we work together, I'm repeating what most of my colleagues say. Hopefully I can get a little different spin on some of it. But when you talk about the portrait of a graduate, that was our combined effort. We did talk to business leaders, community, community leaders, and school leaders. Um, what skill sets do we want? are these children to graduate with, and how do we work backwards in the curriculum to ensure that this happens? Um, you know, what does, our, what does the curriculum look like in third grade, sixth grade, middle school, and high school? I, I would say, as I, as I was an observer for the Portrait of the Graduate Group, I do think a lot of it talked about college-ready skills, but many of us talked tonight about different career paths and CTE education and how that has to evolve as, as when we look at this and we look at the portrait of a graduate. So I think um, that was mentioned tonight. Early education, um, I think we're all on board with that. But again, we and we do have the SKIP committee, and there is a five-year plan. But I do think we need to be more aggressive in looking at that and how we can do that. Lots of people talked about, um, you know, the emerging populations, um, and I am concerned about the programmatic changes that need to occur to our system to truly address the challenge of these emerging populations, combined with the poverty issue and what they bring. We talked about housing patterns. You know, there's the tipping point studies, which we've all referenced, the tipping point where, um, you know, if, if a high school reaches 40 percent of poverty, the, sur the, the quality of education doesn't go down just for those children in poverty, but for the entire school because of the strains put on the system itself. And that's very, very important when you talk about when you talk about the issue of where people live, where they can afford to live, and how the housing patterns are affecting what's in the schools. And I you know this is a really sensitive topic and I think a lot of people aren't comfortable talking about it. But if we're honest about it, this is going to be one of the great this is going to have the greatest impact on our schools and our county as we go forward. Because if you look at our kindergarten populations and what their needs are, fifty percent of our kindergartners are um, English language is their second language and they um, I can't remember the poverty rate of those incoming 36 percent so it, it, it's high a, a third a little more than a third so and you know when we talk about the critical needs um, yes it's cost and funding and um, you know w our board is a school board we have to be measured and strategic as Hank said and we have to set priorities we have to know um, that can't, it all can't be done at once. But I think what we have to do, we have to educate each other on uh, and listen to one another. And we really have to do this outside of budget conversations because, as you said, Sharon, it, it, it gets intense at that point in time. But, so we really truly have to understand what the benefits are if we choose to do it, what the costs are, and really what the potential consequences of not doing it are. And we need to do that throughout the year not just put it on the plate for budget time. And I think this strategic initiative that we're undertaking and doing in conjunction with you is the perfect way to do that. And we need to continue the dialogue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Koufax. Now let me ask supervisors for final comments. Supervisor Harry. <laughs> Are you sure you want me to talk? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you learn a lot by listening, actually. So I've been I've been doing a lot of listening and observing. I, I want to apologize for being late. First, I I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make it at all, and hopefully you got the word I was oh, going to try to get here. But Thanks right, for joining but, us. Um, you know, a lot of things have been talked about. Uh, obviously, land use impact on schools. I think is huge. I mean, I think that's one of the areas. If you talk about where we need to start working together, I think. That is a big area. You know, we just had the conversation on 
and you're you're echoing a point I made at our budget when we pass the budget. We need to be working budget throughout the year, not just when we are at odds with each other over what the number is. I mean, so I'm uh, I'm in 100 percent agreement, and some of you will be seeing more of me on that. I think on the uh, the task force. Um, you know, I I heard a lot about. Let me let me just go. I guess to, just to sum it up a little bit. And, and I heard your point on being utopian, and you know it's it's hard to be your utopian when you're striving to be the best school system in the country, because that's not a utopian thought. We want to be the best school system in the world, in the nation, at least, and I think we are. But it's it's hard to balance those things. So when you're uh, just to just kind of leave you with that thought. I mean, when you average everything out, you're average. You're not you're not the best. And we've got to we got to give everybody the opportunity to be the best that they can be. And we got to strive to be the best school system in the country. And I'm fully on board with the uh, I'm fully on board with that. Thank you, Chairman Blober. Uh, let me just uh, say thank you for this opportunity. I think this has been a really good discussion. And uh, and I and I I agree that it's important that we continue to have opportunities to you know to discuss not just budget but other issues as well. Um, this this has been a good opportunity for us to you know really actually step away a little bit uh, from the immediacy of budget and to look at the larger issue of how do we do things together. Um, how do we plan together better? How do we, you know, choose our priorities in a way that we're both um, trying to sync uh, our respective uh, priorities and goals with each other? Um, we all represent the same people. Our districts are, you know, we, we each represent the same number of, of uh, folks. And so it's important that we make these opportunities available for us to, you know, to, to work together towards those things. So thank, thank you. Um, and uh, I think that the strategic budgeting initiative is, is going to be good. It's going to be, a, you know, give us more time that we need uh, out of the budget cycle to be looking at those things, but then to be looking at things like the CIP and, and, uh, and our larger planning efforts. I also just want to say we had some interesting discussion just now about housing, affordable housing. And I think we need to have a community discussion regarding housing. And we hear that from the business community. We hear that about the need for workforce housing. Uh, we hear that from the schools and the need for housing that is affordable to our teachers, uh, to our public safety folks. Um, but also, um, we need to make sure that we're not concentrating uh, housing uh, in a way that makes it difficult for us to educate kids. And, uh, and so that's, a, I think, a discussion that we need to have. And, and I would like to make that happen. So watch that space. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much again. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us this evening. We need to do this more often. And I will try to find a way to accommodate that. And as far as this strategic plan is concerned, as you know that we are in the middle of this process, we'll provide you with as much updated information as possible and, and seek further input from supervisors. And thank you again. We'll dismiss you and continue on with our own discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So now they're, they're going to talk about us. <laughs> you are very smart. We're on camera, don't worry. <laughs> okay, Dr. Jimichko, I know that we have a rest of the slide, the presentation. You think you can do that in 15 minutes? I think so. Okay, I think we you. can, and I will not be offended if anyone needs to leave to go to graduation. I know that some people, I know some people have left already, but if anyone else has obligations, we said this was gonna end at 6.30, so um, if you have commitments, we certainly understand that. But we did wanna give you just some, uh, some initial information um, to prompt your thinking and to have you start thinking about some issues for our discussion discussions in July. So um, we're going to begin with um, the emerging 
<laughs> Got to point it at the right place. We're oh. going to begin with the emerging themes that are starting to come out of the data. There's still a lot of analysis that is going on, and there'll be more information. You'll have the full data set, um, which is approximately 50 pages at this point, um, mm -hmm. to review prior to our discussion. But um, this is a high-level kind of review. <clears throat> So we're going to begin with where some consistency was between the school board and your stakeholders. <clears throat> um, as you can see, the, the, the values are, are well aligned. And the microphone. Oh, I'm on. Can you hear me? Wasn't in it. Um, as you can see, overall, um, stakeholder values and, and the board um, are consistent. Priorities are consistent. So a lot of the themes, that, uh, um, it was a positive thing for us to hear that, having spoken to each board member individually and then start to look through all of this data that we're collecting. Um, there's a lot of consistency there, which is, uh, makes your job a whole lot easier then. Um, a lot of pride. So the reputation at FCPS is a lot of pride throughout from all stakeholder groups. Um, big, big uh, across all groups, across all issues, uh, consistency is the backdrop. I don't think you'll find that surprising. So whether you're talking about curriculum or technology, whatever the issue is, consistency is the backdrop. So that, that is a common theme throughout, and that's programs initiatives. Um, there's a, a, a huge value in emphasizing the whole child and, and developing character and developing some of these other areas, these skill sets that aren't the typical science, reading, math um, curriculum. Um, stakeholders hold a lot of value in that. And they've acknowledged that there has, they recognize that there are uh, this movement already, but there's a need for a whole lot more of that. Um, they'd like to see a more balanced assessment. I think that's consistent with everyone in the room here. Um, but teachers, even students, would like opportunities to um, be assessed differently and to leave feeling like they've, they've um, learned differently and have been assessed and shown that they can do things in a different way. Um, there's pretty consistent concern around teacher and administration, both in retaining people and in, in attracting the talent and, and in retaining it. Um, but there's a lot of discussion around that because the measure of, it goes beyond credentials, the measure of high quality teaching is not just about a credentialed teacher. So it's more than just the attraction of the right people. It comes in your commitment to, to develop in, in lots of other areas. Um, and then most uh, talked about this evening so far is concern around financial and facility challenges. Um, that's loud and clear as well. Um, so starting off with something that um, resonated throughout all stakeholder groups is the perception of you know, FCPS overall and quality. As you can see, the stakeholders overall um, view their perception and opinions of the, the school system is very positive. So there's high agreement that um, you're providing high quality education here. Overall, 83%. And when you think about that, when, when you look at organizational climate studies in any industry and you're looking at satisfaction ratings or service ratings, um, you know, above 75%, uh, you know, you're looking at the top 25%, but um, you'd want to push above 80%. It's just your baseline. And, and then you have a starting point to push. So your baseline right now is 83%. That gives you an idea of where to start and where to move to for targeting. Um, but, but that's a good spot. It's positive. It's 83% favorable rating is considered high positive. You got that clicker? I have to point it at the right thing. <laughs> Won't go? There we go. Could I talk about this one? Yes. Go um, ahead. One of the things that I think this conversation that we just had um, is illustrated on this particular slide. Um, you know that you have a nationally recognized school di district. You know that your students perform well. Um, you know that your students outperform state averages. But when you disaggregate the data, um, there's a couple of things that start to emerge. And you, you have had lots of conversation about the achievement gap, and you need to continue to work on those kinds of issues. And I'm sure that will be an emerging priority. But I do want you to recognize that you're not just outperforming the state on averages in terms of your total population. If you look at one of your strongest levels of performance, your students with disabilities outperform other students across this state by 10%. You're 10% mm -hmm. higher than other 
um, than the state average in terms of how well your special education population is doing on state measures. That's no small accomplishment. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a recognition that the service and the programs and the work that you do with one of your most needy populations is demonstrating really strong overall results. And the same is true for LEP to some degree. Um, and it breaks it down by not disadvantage, disadvantage. We can have much more of a discussion about this in July. But I want you to recognize that for the educational components, you're outperforming the state averages. And in reality, you're a microcosm of the state average. Given your size mm -hmm. and your diversity, you would predict, just based on general factors, that you would be right around the state average. So the fact that you're outperforming them in many ways is a really strong indication of the quality that happens. But the one piece that I want you to, look, to consider is when you look at the disadvantaged population in terms of poverty, which is exactly the conversation that we were having earlier with the county supervisors, that you're right around the state average. And one of the reasons for that is economics and poverty is a community issue. It's not just a school district issue. Mm -hmm. And so the conversation that started around housing issues, how populations move within the system, how you address those kinds of needs, is not just an issue that you're going to solve solely on your own by the services that you provide. It's going to be an issue that's going to be solved in some way through a countywide approach in terms of wraparound services, how you collocate services and think about those, those issues. So while I didn't know the conversation was going to go in that direction when we started uh, or when we came today, it's interesting that your data um, that we've collected that, yeah. so far on your performance really reflects exactly what the conversation was that you've identified as an issue. And uh, I think the county has identified as an issue too from what um, Sharon Bolova said that housing is an issue that needs to be addressed countywide. So I just, we'll have more discussion about the particular student data in July, but I thought it was interesting that when we looked at this, it really reflected the conversation. Yes, <clears throat> thanks. Okay, and, and here taking a look at um, the portrait of a graduate and 21st century learning in general. Um, stakeholders, when we didn't specifically talk about the portrait of a graduate when we were collecting data, but we talked about the skills and those characteristics and the traits and some of those um, areas that are a little bit more challenging to, to understand. How do you assess that? How do you really know when a student is, is achieving these um, um, areas? Um, so there's a desire for a whole lot more opportunity in there. And in speaking to students, they acknowledge where and when they've had opportunities but certainly they feel the need for more of that. They want it. Teachers want it. Administrators want it. So there's a real desire there to support and, and learn more in that area. Um, holistic instruction, less on standardized testing. Um, a lot of, when, you, when we ask in the open-ended questions to expand on your ratings or to add any additional information, um, a lot of stakeholders felt that the, the focus on standardized testing gets in the way. It's an obstacle and a challenge to being able to go deeper and to go in a more holistic and teach in a more holistic fashion because they're so focused on what those standards are that have to be met. Um, and so that, that was pretty clear. Um, Technology access for all students. This, again, was talked about earlier tonight. It's a, it's a disproportion um, of access. So it's not that, you know, when we talk to teachers and, and to students, oh, sure, it's integrated into the, the curriculum. You know, we, we integrate it when we can. The real issue is that not all kids have access to it. So where there are one-to-one -one initiatives, it's not across the board, and it's very disproportionate. So there is a huge push, and this is where you have to, we have to make sure, as, as bringing you the data, that we synthesize size that although if we asked a question about is it, an, is it a priority to integrate it or is it being integrated, we have to bring the context of all this open-ended qualitative data to tell the real story and that real story is that there's, it's not in enough people's hands. So there's a real issue about um, expanding that access there. Um, and then the programs and activities, um, getting at that whole child development, um, you know, that looking for more ways of the, the men, this is really the mental health, the physical, the overall well, wellness and well-being of students. Um, just one quick aside. I would say you are somewhat unique 
in the fact that you have a community perception and a staff perception that standardized testing sometimes gets in the way. That's not a commonly held view. And a desire for a more um, robust kind of a, uh, assessment system that really assesses the kind of learning that you want to have happen is not where the majority of the nation is right now. So the fact that your your community is thinking about that is really means you're at the forefront. And I would also say that given the tight times that we have all experienced financially, the fact that your, your community still values the whole child aspect mm -hmm. so deeply is really unique. Um, and those are things that you should hold on to because I think there's some of the things that have made a difference about why your community values the quality of education that you have going on in the system already. Oh, we're on that side. Um, looking at the teaching and learning environment overall, this is where you're going to get to some of the um, climate, the workplace environment, um, satisfactions. And in this particular case, looking at students, and we asked them on the survey, as you know, um, their agreement with how happy they were with their school. And 60% of the students agree that they're happy. Um, that's an area for focus, and we can talk more about that in July. That's a, that's a baseline measure that obviously you're going to want to work on that. Um, uh, the context of, um, you know, when students, we asked for to expand on it, a um, lot of discussion around feeling pressure to compete. This was heard openly in focus groups. It was, it was recorded in the open-ended information on the survey. A lot of stress, a lot of competition, a lot of pressure that they have to be the best and, and nothing but AP packing and, and you know, top of the line marks are, are you're, you're, it just doesn't cut it. 74% um, of your employees um, agree that FCPS is a great place to work, and you know, you should feel good about that. I mean, 74% of your employees, when you think about that question, there's a lot of things that people consider in their mind, very rapid fire. Well, do I like working here? Is this a great place to work? And there's a whole lot of things that your mind processes very quickly about whether or not you think it's a great place to work. Um, in July, when we can dig a little deeper into the data, we can sort of look at some of the other factors that might impact that sort of question and give you an idea of how do we increase that. So this is a good baseline measure. Certainly, you'd want to push that over 80%. Um, but it's a good baseline measure and, and, and focus on that because that, that's going to lead to your retention. That's going to that's going to you know lead to a lot of other um, um, workplace and, and um, personnel related issues. Overall, there's a desire for fewer initiatives, greater focus, consistency in the allocation of resources, really optimizing the resources, and not just that there's this spread of you know, um, resources regardless of the need. They, they really talked a lot about, there's a lot of input about um, the, the need to, to be able to allocate greater funds or resources where it's needed rather than just this equity across in some cases. Um, and, and a lot of talk about breadth versus depth. So, and this came from students, it came from teachers, administrators, that the, the coursework and the curriculum and the programs are so broad based. It's kind of, you know, like survey courses. You learn a little bit about so much, but there's no opportunity to dive a little bit deeper and really allow students to, to think a little bit more critically and analytically and develop some of these higher order um, thinking skills. Um, the pace, even parents talked about the pace of curriculum, which was unusual for me. Uh, in a community, when we're in focus groups, to hear parents talk about curriculum pacing is not normal. <laughs> so I was surprised. One, that they knew what that even meant, right? They talked about the curriculum pacing being so rapid that they, they don't feel their kids are learning the depth. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's an area we can talk a little bit more about. And the chart on the right gives you just some of the response, the favorable response rates of agreement um, about whether or not you're making research-based decisions, what's your follow-through like on initiatives, um, and then effective communication, specifically about implementation you know, of initiatives. And just to use this as a highlight for what you might want to think about in July. So the issue is overall um, employee satisfaction with the Fairfax County Public Schools. Well, it's easy to say we want to improve satisfaction. The question then becomes, what is it that you need to do to improve satisfaction? So one of the things that you'll have in the data that will be presented are the items from the survey that are most highly correlated with overall satisfaction. So you can look at those items as the top five items that are correlated 
um, to overall satisfaction and say if we made a difference in two or three of these, would we improve overall satisfaction? And that's part of the conversation that we'll have in uh, July. So if you look at this one, when you talk about FC FCPS makes research-based decisions, follows through on initiatives, and it communicates plans for implementing initiatives. Those items are correlated with satisfaction, and you can see that some of those items are not particularly strong, which might account for why 26% of your employees are not highly satisfied. So making a difference in some of those things by changing your approach to those particular items may improve that overall satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the conversation that we'll have in July based on the data that you will receive beforehand to see what those drivers are in those various areas. Okay, under finance and operations, some of what's emerging again, nothing um, that we haven't spoken about, um, is a challenge of budgetary increases that aren't matching your needs and your enrollment and the changes in your population. Um, we don't need to say any more about that now because enough's been said tonight, but a lot of work there in July. Capital projects, maintenance, technologies that are necessary. Um, same thing. And then improved communication. Um, that was a very common theme that ran deep across and within clusters. Um, that there is a there is a disconnect between the, the district level, the division level, and the buildings. Um, they don't feel that there's a there's it goes from alignment to initiatives to communication to understanding how goals are related between and within. So communication is um, going to be a key piece for you to to focus on. Um, the next steps when we talk about where we're going to be going, I've shared this a little bit in terms of the July conversation of reviewing all the information that we've gathered in a format that will hopefully help you make some decisions that are actionable about what goals or priorities and strategies do you want to pursue. And so we'll have that. But the other thing that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to do this really briefly so we stay under the 15 minute cap, is mission, minutes. vision, and guiding principles. Because we will want to review those and talk about those. I know you've had some conversation with them before. For the most part, your community agrees with your mission. Um, when you look we'll at go the next one, yeah. two more. That's your mission statement. There you go. For the most part, your community, employees, parents agree with, with the overall mission. It may, you may wish to tweak it. We may wish to have some discussion about it. Um, but the piece where you really may want to think about um, your vision is you have a vision statement which is five different categories, I think, and then an elaboration under each one of them. It's not really a vision. Most vision statements are things that you walk away with with an understanding of what that means. It's an aspiration, you, yeah. You can't walk away from the conversation with your vision statement to say where, what is, what is your preferred future look like in a succinct kind of way. Now, you may want it as a description, which may be perfectly fine, but you may also, we also may spend some time talking about that vision to say, is there some way to crystallize that for your employees in your community to help define that vision moving forward? And then the last one, there's a slide in there that talks about what a vision statement is. The last one is your guiding principles. For the most part, there was strong agreement about your guiding principles. We'll have that kind of conversation. The only change that we thought was really necessary is to update the one that's in the box to have it reflect the categories in your portrait of a graduate. And even this one has changed slightly because yeah, you've revised the last column of the portrait yeah. of a graduate. And it, I know it's still uh, an evolving process. But we do think that you want to have your belief statements reflect those areas in the portrait of a graduate that you've identified as priorities. So. We're going to spend time on the 18th and the 19th. We're meeting from 3 o'clock till 7 o'clock um, on Friday evening and then Saturday morning, um, however long it takes to work through that. On Friday evening, we will want to go through the information for an hour, hour and a half of the data report that you will receive beforehand. And you will have it at least 10 days to uh, two weeks July 8th, I think be before um, you're going to review it so you'll have a chance, or before we're going to discuss it, so you'll have a chance to review it. Um, we'll talk about that, answer any questions about the data that you may have, and then move into a conversation around mission, vision, guiding uh, 
our guiding principles. If there's changes that are necessary, hopefully begin that conversation Friday, begin the discussion around goals possibly, and on Saturday, hopefully we can generate the ideas that you want to have on the table and at least start to get some of them prioritized and discussed as to what are the emerging strategies and goals that you think as a board are most important to move forward. Having worked with you before, I know that that may be a challenge. <laughs> I'm confident we'll do it. We'll be done. But I have also seen you work really well on coming together to make some of those decisions. And I would be prepared for the fact that you need to think about what those issues are, but you also need to be prepared for how do we make this a plan that identifies the real priorities. You can't do everything for everyone um, in, this, in this document. You can keep those things in mind. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention to them, but one of the things your staff has been asking for, I think the communication issue is asking for, is how do you clearly define where you want this organization going over the next two, three, four, five years? And that timeline is going to be key. Once you've agreed on the set of priorities um, underneath the goal areas, then how are you going to spread that out? So because you can't do it all in one year. Your, your stakeholders are telling you it's too much going on now. So how are you going to spread that out? And, and that's part of how you prioritize and commit to the resources and the funding and the time. And then I think we're going to spend a little bit of time, a couple of hours in the afternoon, Kathy, talking about the board self-evaluation. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jimitro and Dr. Sinenik. Uh, I know that I promised you to release you by 6.30. We have already almost 20 minutes beyond my promised time. You think you can give us another 10 minutes? Sure. Well, sure. Is that going to hamper you, Trevor? Nope. We're okay. fine. 10 more minutes. 10 minutes. I know I had Mrs. Schurz and Mrs. McLachlan and Mrs. Strauss. They will probably be it. Mrs. Schurz. Just real quickly, on the um, page where we had the, oh gosh, the observations by the community, um, I'm sorry, I passed it, on the, on the um, technology gap, okay, so where it says 21st century learning. And I think it's, I don't know what page it is. So it says global findings, 21st century learning at the top. Um, it, the third bullet says need to expand equity and technology access for all students. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering, is that an anecdotal observation that, that, that was collected? Because when I hear that 6% of people in the county don't have access, you know, I don't know how much that means in terms of our students. And we keep talking about that, and yet, I don't know how quantifiable that is. Like, is that a feeling, or is that, you know, an ident I mean, yeah. you know, that, that it's something that I think we get into the habit of saying, but I don't know if there is, a, you know, something that proves beyond that. Um, and then just I two other quick things. The 74% agree it's a great place to work. Um, how does that compare? I mean, is that good? I don't know what, it, yeah. that's a number and that's a statistic, but I, it's in a vacuum. I don't know what that means in terms of other districts, mm -hmm. high performing districts, low performing, I don't know. And um, the disconnect between the buildings, you know, I'm assuming that means like a campus and the division. Was there any common theme there? I mean, I can clearly see on the agreement on initiative that you know, whether we follow through with initiatives or effectively communicates, that seems to be a huge drop off. And so I don't know if that's what the central theme was around. So just three quick little thingies. Sure. So the response to the first one is, is um, it's qualitative data. So it is not anecdotal. It is qualitative, um, which is not intended to be quantified. So it's a difficult thing what you're asking for because it's a qualitative. But I can tell you that the, the rigor behind how the, the qualitative data is coded is that it has to emerge as a theme. And they're independently coded by two independent coders and a third if there's any discrepancy to resolve it. So it emerged enough times in the qualitative survey data and focus group data that it warranted being a theme. So it's, it's not anecdotal. It's ac across different stakeholder groups, across different forms of data collection. Okay. 
I want to, um, and the 74 will get a sense. Just a ballpark response to that is 74% is good, but certainly not great. Yeah, you'd want to push for, for 80%. Okay, um, and I'm not sure I understand the disconnect between the building. Um, there was a theme presented that there seems to be a disconnect between build, buildings. Yep. Right. So, right. And again, that is um, definitely regarding the initiatives. There was a lot of discussion and survey um, open-ended um, that when, uh, sticking with initiatives, when initiatives are enrolled, that there is no clear communication, that when it hits the buildings, it's there, but they don't know why, what was the purpose of it, what are we trying to, what is our point, what are we trying to achieve with this? Um, it's just suddenly here, you have to do this. So communication in that respect. Okay, uh, Mrs. McLaughlin. Um, two things, first, um, as someone who has teenagers in our public schools, three of them, I, I have to say the slide where it showed only 60% of our children agree that they're happy in their school, uh, that saddened me. And I, I know our superintendent, I know our board is committed to trying to better understand that. To me, that was just an absolutely powerful number. Because uh, I hear it anecdotally, um, but I, I really look forward to getting a better sense of what's affecting that number. Because we are a great school system, but that number's telling me something's not quite happening in our intention, in the way we're creating an environment, a learning environment for them. And as we talked about earlier, to solve a problem, you have to identify right. you know, what the actual problem is. So that's just a number. And then if we can get underneath it and understand what it might be, then hopefully we'll have some wonderful solutions to move forward on that. Um, so I want to thank you for highlighting that, because I think it's given me a lot to think about. Um, the second thing is that. Um, Hank, I was really drawn by what you said um, the, in terms of what the purpose of this whole strategic plan is about. And I'm trying to remain very optimistic about what we're about to embark on because I do understand a strategic plan is that you hope to set and identify goals, you know, what are going to be your priorities. Um, but I think where I'm, it's giving me some pause that maybe you could just highlight a little bit and we'll talk about in July, is that we do still have a responsibility to operate and um, continue our existing responsibilities in terms of delivering um, a quality education K-12. And so I agree um, with the conversations we've had in the future, I mean, conversations we've had in the past that we can't keep trying to take on new things. But could you just maybe speak a little bit more about how this will look different because the idea of having to say no, saying no to new initiatives versus saying no to addressing existing service problems, I see as differently. And I wanted to know if I'm if that's the case because you can't say no to an existing problem, right? Yeah, I, I don't think the issue is saying no to a problem. I think the issue is identifying the priorities of the organization moving forward. So if you take that portrait of a graduate and you say there's approximately 15 items, maybe 18 items on that, that are your priorities for what students should be able to accomplish. Where is it that you should be spending your time, your money, your energy as an organization to accomplish those things? And you know, there's some emerging themes here that things, things that people have said that they, that are important. You, um, but, and so you have to factor those kinds of things in. But for instance, you spend a lot of time and energy on your current 12 um, OMs, uh, OEs. Is that, are those things really driving the information and what you want to be doing to move the system forward? If they are, by all means, spend the time there. If they're not, stop spending administrative and organizational time collecting data and managing that information and replace it with the things that relate back to the priorities that you have identified. So when I, when I say identifying priorities, I'm not saying that you don't want to be responsive to your stakeholders, you don't want to be responsive to issues that arise. But at the same time, you want to use your resources of time, money, and energy 
judiciously on your priorities. And so the conversation about those priorities are, once you've established them, you know, some of those OE reports that you do take hundreds of man hours to collect that data. If that data means something to you as a board and to the organization to move the organization forward, by all means continue to do it. If you're just doing it because you've done it for the last seven or eight years and it's not adding value to the work that you're doing, that's maybe something you could stop doing and spending time on in terms of the time that it takes to generate that information and reallocate that time someplace else. And I think that's one of the messages from your staff. It's not that mm -hmm. they don't want to work on new initiatives to improve the quality of education, but they want to do it well. They want to do it thoughtfully. They want to have the time to implement it. And so maybe picking the two or three priorities for the year rather than the five or six and giving them enough lead time to prepare for it, to know that this is on the horizon next year and to be thinking about it. Those are the kinds of things that the strategic plan should help you identify to improve your overall approach. And that just actually cut across a couple of those points, the communication, the allocation, and the disproportionality. Because if it's whatever the initiative is, it should make the decisions for everyone in this room a whole lot easier. Um, going back to, I think Jeff maybe had mentioned it, he's looking forward to how it's going to be tied back to the initiatives. That's the key piece of the strategic plan. It should be the framework for how you make decisions and when you say yes and no. If you're, you're, what you should do when when your approach is look back and reflect back and say, is this in alignment with what we've committed? And if it isn't, you may say no or maybe or maybe some adaptation of it. But that's key. And the second part is communication, clear, clear and, and advanced. You can't always do that if it's a crisis or some external variable comes in that you, you know, legislation requires you or a mandate. But where you can, you, you need to put emphasis on, on communicating sooner and more thoroughly. And then seeing it out, the commitment to the initiatives. Um, a lot of stakeholders said, um, you know, it was a race to see who can get the money to do it or the funds or it ran out real quick because if two school bu buildings were involved in the committee, they got it in the resources. But when other others heard about it, well, the resources are all gone. We can't go beyond these two buildings that, that this is going on in. So it, it's some of that. Some of the, That's the inconsistency piece. Okay, thank, thank you. That, that's great. And with regard to the OEs, I could not have captured it more beautifully than you did. So thank you. And I hope you'll lead us toward more productive work. Thank you. I have Mr. Strauss as the last one. Okay, Ian, obviously we're all very concerned about the neediness of, the growing neediness of, of a larger and larger percentage of our, of our population. Um, nationwide, we're watching a lot of public schools become the, the, the schooling of the last resort. And we don't want that to happen here. We want all of our kids to be well served. The 35% who are in poverty and then the 65, 70% that are not. And I guess when you were doing your, um, uh, all your various focus groups. Did you talk to any people who have chosen not to be in the public schools? And I don't know if that's something that we need to worry about because as, as, as we watch the economy and sort of the 1% get or up the 1% and we have a lot of those folks here, very powerful people in industry, they want, you know, they want to bring the big companies here. We would have to make sure that those guys are supporting our public schools, not just in the abstract, because it looks good, but we need to be good enough to educate their children. Because over time, parents vote with their feet, and then we lose the political will to maintain the aspect of being a common school, where we really provide good programs for all children, because it is good for all children. And is there is that something we should be worried about here? I is don't. Sense I don't think that? we targeted that particular group of no, people to invite them in. But if that's one of the things that we need to find out, that may be one of the strategies or the initiatives that emerges to find out mm -hmm. why, why people may choose to leave Fairfax. Right. Because I I would have a hunch, having worked in many systems where that is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And there are many systems where right. there's a huge I problem. Know. Your reputation and the quality that you provide is that's a really minor issue here. But I could right. be wrong about but that. But we wouldn't want to slip. Right. Exactly. Because once you, you begin what we call it urbanize, it's very hard to get it back. And then nobody wants to pay anything to help. It's we're helping all the kids on the other side of the tracks, you know, not us. And that's that's just awful for public school. Okay. Okay, thank you. With that, this work session is John. We'll see you again in July. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And Dan forgot his birthday cake, so if anyone wants to eat some.